This is Jeremy Roth Cushell. I'm joined today by Seth Abramson, an American professor, attorney, author, and political columnist, and the author of the crucial Proof of trilogy, first Proof of Collusion, then Proof of Conspiracy, and now soon to be released on September 8th, Proof of Corruption, Bribery, Impeachment, and Pandemic in the Age of Trump. Thank you so much for joining us today, Seth Abramson. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. The subtitle of our show is Understanding Israel-Palestine. And so though your topics of analysis are much more wide-ranging than that, I think that the word understanding is really where you can help us in terms of how your writing fits into understanding the geopolitics of our moment, this recent announcement between the Israelis and the Emiratis, and then more generally, this shift in the Trump policy in the Middle East. And one thing that you do really well is you are a not only a curatorial journalist and that you draw together thousands of sources from around the world, but I would also say that you are a synergistic journalist and that you work to draw these disparate threads into meaning and narrative that people can understand. So would you first start out and help us understand why this recent release of the Senate Intelligence Committee's fifth and final volume on the Trump-Russia counterintelligence inquiry is so tied into the relationship between and amongst the U.S., Russia, Israel, and the UAE? Well, what we had, Jeremy, in 2019 was the release of the Mueller report, which, of course, focused on criminal issues associated with alleged Trump-Russia collusion. But on page 10 of volume one of that report, Robert Mueller indicated that all counterintelligence information related to the Trump-Russia question was being held back from the report, was being forwarded on by Mueller's office, his agents and investigators to the FBI counterintelligence division. And so we knew that at some point there would have to be something coming out of the counterintelligence community, either directly from the CIA or the FBI, or more likely from Congress in its oversight capacity, telling us what all that evidence was that was not necessarily looked at from a criminal prosecution standpoint, but a national security standpoint. So the thousand page Senate Select Committee on Intelligence report that was just released within the last couple weeks is the counterintelligence report that we're going to get about the Trump-Russia question, but what we found is that it really covers so much more. It raises all counterintelligence threats related to collusion, and that's where some other countries that I have written about, including Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Israel, starting to come tangentially into what Congress is telling us about what happened in 2016. And you point out in a tweet of yours after the release of the Senate Intelligence Committee's report On August 20th, you say breaking, the Senate Intelligence Committee report solved the Trump-Russia and Trump-UAE collusion mysteries simultaneously. Using the report, this thread explains that collusion wasn't what or where many thought. Will you draw out what you realized in relationship to the new details that were brought out in this report, specifically about how to understand properly the 2016 collusion operation? It has to be understood beyond the bilateral question of Trump, Russia, or the U.S. and Russia, and into what you call a quadrangle that then includes primarily the UAE and Israel. Sure. So just to bring your listeners up to speed, in uh, 2018, I published Proof of Collusion, which is about Trump-Russia collusion. In 2019, Proof of Conspiracy looked at Trump UAE, that would be the United Arab Emirates, Trump Saudi Arabia, and Trump Israel collusion. So the question that remained that many were hoping would be either completely answered or partially answered by the SSCI thousand page report that just dropped is, what was the connection, if any, between the various courses of international collusion that the Trump campaign engaged in in 2015 and 2016. And so what I wrote in that Twitter thread is that I think the report indirectly gives us that answer. And I'll try to sort of in three or four sentences summarize it for your listeners. But basically in January of uh, 2016, one of Donald Trump's best friends, Thomas Barrick, a businessman who has made most of his money through deals with the Emirati royal family, and who also, by the way, happens to be one of Jared Kushner's chief lenders, was the person, along with Jared Kushner himself, who got Paul Manafort onto the Trump campaign. We now know 
Paul Manafort to have been at the center of Trump-Russia collusion in 2016. We get that from both the Mueller report and the Senate report. Now, your listeners may be aware that the Kushner family, like the Trump family, is very close with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. So shortly after, in March 2016, Thomas Barrick and Jared Kushner get Paul Manafort brought on board the Trump campaign. And Paul Manafort, again, is at the center of Trump-Russia collusion, according to both the Mueller report and the Senate report. Within 96 hours of Manafort coming on the campaign, Israeli agents, specifically in the person of Benjamin Netanyahu's former chief of staff, George Birnbaum, show up and offer to help the Trump campaign with a cyber intelligence campaign that dovetails with what the Kremlin is currently operating at that point in spring of 2016 on behalf of the Trump campaign, or I should say to aid the Trump campaign. The Israeli cyber intelligence campaign that gets offered to the Trump campaign in the spring of 2016 is ultimately paid for by George Nader, who is a top advisor to Mohammed bin Zayed, the leader of the United Arab Emirates. George Nader is now in federal prison, but more importantly for your listeners, they should know that George Nader was the liaison between the UAE and the Kremlin. So we have this intersection of the UAE, Russia, and Israel in the spring of 2016, specifically surrounding this cyber intelligence campaign that Israeli agents will execute and the Emiratis will pay for to help the Trump campaign win in 2016. Ultimately, the Senate Intelligence Committee report states that basically none of these Israeli intelligence corporate operations were ever taken up. But you point to data that suggests that that is not the case. And I might suggest, too, that in terms of the dual nature of these operations, one of them proposed is a pre-Republican convention uh, attempt to wrangle support for Donald Trump, and then one that seems to be focused on the dirty politics or opposition research in regards to the Hillary Clinton campaign. And the involvement of George Birnbaum, so close to uh, Netanyahu, seems to suggest Arthur Finkelstein, the guru of Republican dirty politics, who saved Netanyahu and brought him into power over Perez in 1996, and also the direct teacher of people like Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, pollsters for the Trump campaign like John McLaughlin and Tony Fabrizio. McLaughlin, by the way, coming directly out of a working relationship with Netanyahu into the Trump campaign, might suggest that they had decided to go another route. And we do know that Arthur Finkelstein did play a crucial role in what you might call mainstreaming Trump into the RNC. But will you help us understand how the operation actually resolved? So as you mentioned, there were two cyber intelligence campaigns offered by the Israelis in spring 2016 to the Trump campaign. One of them had to do with the Republican National Convention, and that was unnecessary once the convention had already happened, of course. And the other was a sort of primordial version of the plan that ultimately did occur and was executed by the Israeli firm Psy Group, which again was introduced to the Trump campaign by Benjamin Netanyahu's former chief of staff. And that campaign, which dovetailed with the Kremlin cyber intelligence propaganda campaign that was running at the same time, that campaign focused on three groups. That would be black voters, suburban women, and disaffected Sanders voters. And so Joel Zamel, the head of Psy Group, the Israeli firm that executed this latter campaign in the summer of 2016 to aid the Trump presidential campaign, confessed directly to George Nader, a Trump advisor who is now in federal custody and in fact has been convicted of charges related to child pornography. He confessed that he did execute a campaign to aid the Trump campaign during the election. That information is not contained within the Senate report. I'm not sure why, but it was reported by major media. The nature of the campaign that he confessed to George Nader he had run, this is Zamel confessing, was identical to what the propaganda campaign of the Kremlin and the propaganda campaign ultimately, frankly, confessed to by the Trump campaign was. It focused on black voters, suburban women, and disaffected Bernie Sanders voters. So we do know that a campaign did occur. It just wasn't the two campaigns that were most focused on by the Senate committee, those being the discarded plans that Psy Group gave to the Trump campaign in spring 2016. In terms of finishing up this analysis relevant to this moment, both in terms of the obvious question of the upcoming election 
and the report seems to black out new information that potentially e- even involves what's going on right now in terms of attacks on on our election and i saw that the very end of the report includes a singular statement from senator wyden saying that he believes that way too much was redacted for political reasons but putting that aside will you help us understand I believe you call it the uh, grand bargain, which represents the geopolitics of what made this election attack work amongst these different political entities around the world. Will you explain to us how the attack on the election is related to the geopolitical interests that are coming into fruition right now with the announcement of the uh, Israeli-United Arab Emirates so-called peace deal or diplomatic overt relationship? how that might relate to the Palestinian people and more generally what it means about American foreign policy. Well, I would put it this way. The Trump campaign and the Trump administration have considered it beneficial to them to pretend that this detente between Israel and the UAE just happened and that Donald Trump made it happen while he was president and that the Trump administration should get credit for it and win a Nobel Peace Prize for orchestrating it But in fact, all the evidence we have suggests that the detente began many years ago. On the Emirati side, it was focused on gaining access to Israeli cyber intelligence innovations for the Israelis building a coalition to counter Iran. The cost for the Emiratis was having to put aside the Palestinian question entirely. And the cost for the Israelis, of course, was sharing certain of its national security assets with a country that had formerly been an adversary. So the grand bargain was struck in fall of 2015, and this comes from reporting indicating that a series of nations, Egypt is in that group, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, to assist a chosen politician that those countries believed would be able to counter the influence of Iran in the region. And the idea was that if they gave up the Palestinian question, the Muslim side, those countries in the region they would be able to cut a deal with Israel to create a new coalition to counter Iran. But this deal was struck and Netanyahu was aware of it and was involved in it in 2015 and 2016 years ago. It is not something that just happened in 2020. Chapter three and four of your book that was published last year, Proof of Conspiracy, How Trump's International Collusion is Threatening American Democracy. Chapter three is titled The Young Prince, Israeli Spies, the NRA Junket, and the Flynn Intel Group. And chapter four is titled The Emirati Ambassador, the Mayflower Hotel, and Project Rome. In finishing up, would you tie us back to understanding this question of the intelligence operation? You started out by talking about how the Mueller investigation was a criminal investigation and very overtly passed off counterintelligence material to others, including the FBI counterintelligence division. Now we've seen some of that counterintelligence material coming out of the Senate. And one thing about an intelligence operation, which obviously all of this was to some extent is that there's a limited capacity for criminal levels of things like evidence and proof to be able to deal with it appropriately because intelligence operations are inherently meant to be plausibly deniable. There are uses of cutouts. And I think what you've explained to us in many ways is by putting in this whole missing Middle Eastern part, especially surrounding this relationship amongst Israel and then their Arab partners of the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia most especially, that this was all drawn together. And so the question of the Israeli intelligence operation, somewhat at the core of this report that's not being really frontally dealt with, does have to do with this group called Psy Group, Wikistrat. But then there's this other group called NSO Group that Flynn, I believe, was involved with an affiliate of as an advisor, And then even the Justice Department official who defined the scope of Mueller's investigation into Trump Russia, Rod Rosenstein, is a legal counsel to the NSO group who has been alleged to have been supplied by Israel to the Saudis, for example, in their operation to assassinate uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Is there something that we should pay attention to in relationship to this specific Israeli cyber weapon mix here? 
So NSO Group is, as you noted, an Israeli cyber intelligence firm, and its chief asset and product is called Pegasus. And that particular technology was shared with both the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia as part of this clandestine detente between those countries that began a number of years ago. One of those targeted using the Pegasus software is actually a high-profile Trump enemy, Jeff Bezos, of Amazon. And what we see during the Trump administration are clandestine efforts to, for instance, sell F-35s to the United Arab Emirates and to sell bombs to the Saudi Arabian military, even over the disapproval and, in fact, the direct contradiction of legislation and guidance that has been passed by Congress. And the reason for this particular, what appears to be a quid pro quo, the sharing of technology between Israel and UAE and Saudi Arabia to the benefit of Donald Trump, then leading to military assistance from Israel and the United States to the UAE and Saudi Arabia is very concerning, partly because of what you said, the connection between NSO Group and Michael Flynn. And Michael Flynn really is at the center of the NSO group and frankly just the Israeli cyber intelligence efforts during the 2016 campaign. As we learned from a criminal case, we often get counterintelligence information out of criminal investigations. So the Roger Stone case in particular, the search warrant applications in that case revealed that top Trump advisor Roger Stone was directly in touch with Israeli nationals during the 2016 presidential campaign about how to use Israeli cyber intelligence to aid Trump specifically Israeli cyber intelligence that was going to come with the assistance of the Turkish government at a time when we now know Michael Flynn was actually working as a Turkish agent, though he wouldn't register as one for many, many months after that. So it's a complicated story. Michael Flynn and Roger Stone and Paul Manafort and Jared Kushner are at the center of it. But in terms of the Palestinian question, the upshot is this. You have some very powerful Sunni Muslim countries in the Middle East that have agreed to put aside the Palestinian question fundamentally in order to strike a deal with Israel and the United States, but not the United States generally, Donald Trump specifically, and not even Israel generally, but Benjamin Netanyahu specifically. And I think that that would be very concerning to anyone who is hoping for a peaceful resolution of the Palestinian question. As an American deeply involved in helping understand what happened, how we got here, would you let us know what you believe we, the people, need to be paying attention to in these next months? I think that despite the recent counterintelligence assessment that imagines that the only three threats we're facing right now to our electoral infrastructure are Russia, Iran, and China, I think the reality is not only are two of those countries, in fact, very much because of their past collusion with Donald Trump, interested in working on behalf of Trump's campaign through collusion, that would be China and Russia. But there are other threats specifically from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and frankly, from Israel as well, using Israeli cyber intelligence that we have to be very concerned about. We don't want to wake up in 2021 or 2022 and find out that for a second election in a row, there was unreported Trump UAE, Trump Saudi, and Trump Israeli collusion. I think that would be incredibly damaging to our democracy. And that's why, frankly, I wrote this third book in the Proof series, Proof of Corruption, to further advance the story of Trump's collusion, not just with Russia, but also the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, and how, frankly, his activities in Ukraine and elsewhere further dovetailed with the sort of courses of collusion that we've been talking about here. Well, thank you so much for your for your time and your work, Seth Abramson. Can you uh, let our listeners know who are interested to find out about your upcoming book and your work more generally, where they can go to find that? Sure. So Proof of Corruption comes out September 8th. It's the third book in the Proof series. It's available wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and so on. And you can find me on Twitter at Seth Abramson, S-E-T-H-A-B-R-A-M-S-O-N. Thank you so much, Seth Abramson. Thank you, Jeremy.